The next presentation is on weed seeds and it's a virtual presentation by Stephanie. All right. Hey everyone. My name is Stephanie Coleza. I'm the nutrient management and animal waste specialist at NC State. Uh, and I want to talk to you today about some work we've been doing um, looking at weed seeds and poultry litters and whether they exist. So broiler production in North Carolina, we have a really large uh, broiler industry. And especially this year, due to the high fertilizer prices, we're seeing poultry litter moving all across the state. Uh, and with this, those who have not received poultry litter in the past often have concerns about whether the litter is bringing on weed seeds to their farm. Uh, and so this is a major concern for those who don't utilize manures. And so this year we've gotten a lot of calls um, and we also know that that is a, a major concern of theirs. Um, and so I also got into this because uh, I had a field trial that had a lot of weeds in it. Um, and so I was looking at crabgrass as a forage crop. Uh, we did have some manure treatments in here, and I wanted to make sure that I addressed the concerns of, of anyone who was coming out to the field site or who was um, viewing the presentations I was giving on this, on this work. Uh, and so we did a germination study to see whether those weeds were in, indeed coming from the seed bank and not from the poultry litter that we were applying. And so in that, we started out looking just at the, the one soil type that was in our field study area. Um, and then we also had sand as a control medium. Um, and then we had the, those two substrates with and without litter. And then those two substrates, we also had uh, either autoclaved or non-autoclaved. And that's to tell us uh, or really confirm that the weed seeds uh, are coming from the soil. Uh, and we replicated that 10 times. And so here I'm showing the results of this quick little study just to, to verify where those weeds were coming from. On the y-axis, we had number of seedlings that came out of those 10 replicates. Um, and going from left to right, we have our um, non-autoclave treatments. And then on the right-hand side, we have our autoclave treatments. And the biggest thing we see here is that soil without any poultry litter had the highest germinable weed seed. Um, and also when we autoclaved everything, um, it was, there was no germination coming from the litter at all. Uh, and so this really told us in this one particular instance that the weed seeds were coming from the soil. But this is again, just one example. And so I wanted to look at this more broadly, which led me to contact our area spe specialized agents in poultry. We're very lucky in extension and have some really great agents to work with. I called them and said, look, I need some random poultry litters and we put no sideboards on it. It can come directly from the house. It can come from stockpiling, doesn't matter. And they got me 61 different litters in about two weeks time. Uh, and so I was able to take a look at these through both growth studies uh, as well as wet sieving studies. And so we started out looking at these 61 litters in a grow out study. Uh, and so we initially tried to germinate seeds right out of the poultry litter and found out very quickly that due to the high salts content and um, other impact, uh, other issues, we were not able to get anything to germinate, even if we were spiking weed seeds into it. So we knew we had to dilute it uh, because we were seeing a toxicity effect. And so we diluted it with potting media. And so each Petri dish had 20 grams of a poultry litter potting media mix. Uh, and this was a nine to one ratio potting media to litter on a dry weight basis. And so this came to about uh, a gram of litter per dish um, for each one of these five replicates. We also had two sets of controls. We had controls with just straight potting media and controls with a potting media litter mix. And we had seeded and unseeded of both of those. And this was to compare our uh, potting media litter mix to, to see if we were having any of that inhibition of germination due to the litter being present. Uh, and then those controls we seeded with mustard, wheat, and sickle pod. Mustard and wheat we seeded with 50 seeds each. Uh, and then sickle pod we had 30 seeds since it's a larger seed. And then we put those in a germination chamber for 21 days. And the results of that showed that, um, well, here's the setup first. We, we weighed out our litter. We mix those in our Petri dishes. Uh, the ones in the sticker with the stickers on them are the uh, seeded controls. And then we put those in a germination chain. Uh, and the controls, they germinated really well. We saw really great germination. And, and so 
The results of this study showed that there was only one um, weed seed that germinated out of the 61 litters over the 21-day growth experiment, uh, and that was a, a grass seed. Um, wheat had a higher germination than mustard and sickle pod, but there was no impact of that potting media litter mix once we had all the results from the study. And so, woohoo, let's go spread litter everywhere. Um, but let's hold on just a second. Like I said, we did two different types of studies on these litters, um, and the second one tells a bit of a different story. So we wanted to uh, uh, go through and figure out what is the total seed content that we have in the litter. Um, and then, you know, just to verify uh, that our germination study was picking up, um, you know, accurate results. And so we randomly se selected 15 of the 61 litters to do through this wet sieving protocol, because this is a, a really time intensive method. Um, and so that's about 25% of the, the samples that were submitted. We went through this process. We took 20 grams of each of those litter and replicated that three times. And then we sieved these through three different sieve sizes. And the sieve size mesh openings ranged from 0.4 to 2.8 millimeters. Then once we sieved those, which they were rinsed with water to make sure all of the particles um, were, were cleaned and, and sieved, um, we backwashed those onto a filter paper and dried it. Uh, dried the material at 35 degrees C. Uh, then once those were dry, we took them out of the oven and uh, removed and counted seeds using a dissecting microscope. Uh, and then seed viability testing uh, was conducted using an imbibed crush test. And that just involved having a Petri dish with a, a moist filter paper. We put the seeds on top of that for 24 hours and then uh, lightly pressed with forceps. If the seed um, showed some resistance prior to uh, collapse and was not mushy on the inside, and then we counted that as a viable seed. Um, it, any seeds that were hollow, broken, um, or that, you know, disintegrated when you pressed them with forceps, those were uh, considered non-viable. So our results, like I said, this is a very different story as compared to um, our initial grow out studies. So we did find quite a few seeds. We found 54 seeds uh, across these 15 litters with the vast majority being amaranth seeds. And so about 68% of the total seeds were amaranth and 60% of the viable seeds were amaranth. Um, and 12 of the 15 litters had seeds present. That's total, um, total seeds. Uh, but six of those litters contained viable weed seeds. So about 40% of those 15 litters uh, that we analyzed actually had viable seed present. Um, our viable seed content when, when uh, there was viable seed present ranged from 1.66, which was our method detection limit, uh, to five seeds per 100 grams of litter. Um, average viable seed content across the whole study was 1.11 seeds per 100 grams of litter. Just to put this into a little context or into context, I want to do a little math. So how does this influence the existing seed bank? So at a moderate or common application rate of three tons per acre, which is 6.7 megagrams per hectare, we would add approximately 75,000 seeds per hectare. And you might be thinking, whoa, that is a lot of seeds. And I personally was shocked. <laughs> um, that's 7.5 seeds per viable seeds per meter square. And again, that sounds like a lot of seeds. But how many seeds are already existing in the seed bank? So Reinhardt and Leon did a really good study looking at, uh, or they were comparing different methods for assessing the seed bank. And they found through a similar uh, method as we use that the mean density was 58 seeds per 100 grams. And so when we convert that to per meter squared in soil, that's over 170,000 seeds per meter squared. Now that seems really high. Um, they didn't um, test the viability with the imbibed crush test like we did. And so that likely is a little higher than what we would have found had we been doing it with the same method. Um, they did find amaranth in 47% of their samples or 96 of those samples. Um, and their density was much, much higher when uh, amaranth seeds were present. And so they had an average of 826 amaranth seeds per 100 grams of soil when amaranth was detected in, the, in that sample. 
Um, and so that shows that, you know, it can be much, much higher. Um, Roberts in 1970 out in New York found that uh, there was a range of 4,000 to 131,000 seeds per meter squared in soil. And so that's, that's much lower, but still, even at the lowest end, 4,000, we're still increasing our seed bank um, by less than 0.2%. And so this is to put this into context. At a three-ton application rate, while seven and a half seeds per meter squared seems like a lot, uh, our existing soil seed bank can be much, much higher. And so the next steps for this project are to determine the source of this contamination. So uh, we want to figure out, is it the feed? Is it the storage? Is it the bedding material? Um, do, is there a difference between species and life stage? So I showed a map of broiler production, but we also have a lot of turkey production in North Carolina. So we will also want to see if there's differences there. And then whether any treatment and handling um, methods impact uh, the, the presence of these seeds as well. Um, and so that's, that's what we're hoping to do in the future. Um, but as of now, I can no longer say that there's no weed seeds in poultry litter. Uh, so we're hoping to, to nail down what best management practices can be used in the future to try to minimize that number um, and get that down to um, really get at those concerns that growers may have about utilizing this material. With that, I'm all finished up and have time for questions. Did you know, I guess, have you looked to see how many seeds they were intaking versus what was passing through and coming through the manure? Yeah, no, like I said, these are all randomly submitted poultry litters. Uh, and so we have no idea uh, whether they were turkey versus broiler, stockpiled versus in-house. This was just to take a look at what's there. Uh, now that we know that there are seeds definitely there, uh, we need to dig into this uh, much deeper. And so that's why we want to start looking at the source of the contamination. Previous studies have shown very few uh, or low percentages of seeds that, that are taken into uh, poultry are excreted viable. Um, and so I have the feeling that it's coming from somewhere else, but we definitely need to confirm that. Um, and so that's, that's going to be part of our future studies, hopefully, is really diving into the source of the contamination and then also treatment, potential treatment options to reduce viability, such as composting. Any other questions at all? Stephanie, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you. All of you, thank you for coming to the session.